Who's got a good seat over there? You're welcome, Anita. Thank you. 
It's like there's one over there. But What's that? There. I said, no, I didn't know if you were looking for a tripod. I said, there's one over there. <laughs> always, always bring one. Just in case. <laughs> one of the meetings, I think somebody left one behind. I'm sure that happens a lot. Let me know if I'm in your way. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome all to a regularly scheduled meeting in the Town of Montgomery Planning Board for Monday, August 26, 2019. I believe there are some agendas on the front desk for anyone who would like to follow along. Um, can I see a show of hands for people who would like to make a comment on something not on tonight's agenda? Okay. Yes, please identify yourself for the record. I'm okay. Oh, I thought he was coming up. Go ahead. Oh. You want me to use the microphone? Or? Yeah, and if you could, you know, we've only got about 10 minutes for comment because we've got three public hearings and a, a, a number of other things to go over. Yes, sir. So, appreciate it. Good evening. My name is Thomas Walcott. I'm from the village of Maybrook. Hi. I have no vested interest in Medline Industries or Blue Water Industrial Partners, and I have no professional nor personal association with Mr. Featherstone of Mazer Consulting. Mr. Featherstone is the current Town of Montgomery Planning Board Lead Consulting Engineer. Concurrently, he serves on the Orange County Partnership as a principal associate on the board of directors. Per Orange County Partnership's web page, its mission is to find the most advantageous and cost-effective location for corporate attraction and expansions. Orange County Partnership is a private marketing agency for business development with an extensive history of support for Medline Industries. It is also noteworthy that Blue Water Industrial Partners is listed on Orange County Partnerships Investor Directory. As a taxpayer, I question if due diligence is being completed in an objective 
manner given the circumstances? Has the system of professional review been compromised? Did Mr. Featherstone submit a disclosure notice regarding his involvement with Orange County Partnership, Medline Industries, or Blue Water Industrial Partners? Did Mr. Featherstone recuse himself due to any conflicts of interest? Realistically, can one render an objective and professional re review of Medline DEIS and Blue Water FEIS with vested interest in two diametrically opposed objectives? In conclusion, these are not idle questions without merit. On the contrary, they are being asked with the expectation that he will discharge his duties to the public's best interest, not corporate. In my opinion, any and all decisions regarding Medline Industries and Blue Water Industrial Partners will remain suspect until these issues are resolved. Anything less will be a disservice to the community, a violation of public trust, and perhaps an act of nonfeasance. Respectfully submitted. Hi, I'm Steve. How are you? Pretty good. Good. I just want to bring to your attention that we are loading dumpsters of scrap metal at the ASAP Recycling. Okay. I have a photo from my yard with the truck with the container loaded on the scale, scale right on. It is going on. It's been going on. And that was on Friday. They left this morning, what it looks like, and actually there's another truck with a loaded container on the back of it, on the back of the roll-off truck that's on the scale. I just want to bring it to you guys' attention. Okay. Is there something that should be done? Mm-hmm. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, Susan? Yeah, um, I just had a question for, um, I just had a question because, um, when you were reviewing, this doesn't work. Yeah, it's not working. Just got to switch on it. Turn on. Switch on. Anyway, I don't think I need it. When you were reviewing, um, DEIS and Mr. Montemarano had said that, um, he was not in favor of accepting it because mm -hmm. the town supervisor had said, um, to the developer that he would provide water and sewer. I was just wondering, because I was looking, that's so speculative, and I agree with his objection that he accepted it. Maybe the attorney can answer. Um, does that hold up that if the town supervisor promises water and sewer without a vote of the board? How can that be any part of a proposal? This is a comment section. Yeah. Okay, well, I'd like to know. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so we'll go into our, our the first public hearing of this evening, 915 Route 17 K, LLC, Skavitsky Moderno, SEU permit, site plan, tree lock, commercial subdivision, the continuation of public hearing. I was representing the applicants, Larry Marshall. How are you, Larry? Good, how are you? Fill us in on uh, uh, we do have several documents into the board uh, regarding uh, this application. Uh, this is a continuation of a public hearing for a three-lot subdivision and site plan. Um, we, we are awaiting comments from your consultants um, regarding lighting, uh, the revised plans, uh, the revised site plan, um, some other documentation as well. So what we ask the board is that uh, while we're here to uh, receive public comment, uh, we don't uh, have anything new to present. We're waiting back for comments to, to be able to revise the plans and reports and et cetera. Uh, so we ask the board to can receive whatever comments and then continue it on to the next one. Okay. Yes, Andrew, go ahead. Larry, we got the, uh, the traffic review uh, response on August 15th, so that's under review, and site plan comments are due back to the board on uh, the 2nd okay. before our workshop, so we should have that. On your latest uh, set of plans, it says sheet one uh, had a revision the end of July. Do you know what? It, it's not identified clearly. But I didn't know what it was. The end of July. Um, I believe 
that was associated with the hours of operation. I, I believe I'll have to check on that, okay. um, but I'll I'll confirm that. Okay. I believe that was the only reason. All right. Thank you. Um, so this hearing will stay continued beyond this evening. Uh, the applicant and board are awaiting comments from our consultants. And then we'll review them and we'll discuss them. Um, this is a public hearing, so we'll entertain a public comment. Uh, this, this hearing has been opened uh, since June, so um, hopefully we'll hear something we haven't heard before. And if you can, as we're going to continue this, if you can keep your comments kind of brief so we can move through our agenda this evening. So is there anyone that would like to make a comment on 915-17K at this time? Yes, Sharice? Thank you. I think if it may help, um, clarification, I think it was the addition of the berm as well, and not just the change of the hours of operation. But again, we can verify that for that update. points I would like to talk to today is in talking about the replacement of the deciduous trees and the shrubs, which has been offered to help alleviate the uh, visual effects of the building. Uh, it is offset by evergreens. It removes the diversity of the trees. In 41419, the Town of Montgomery Conservation Advisory Council said, quote, since a lot of trees are being removed, the type and variety of trees being replaced is important. The landscaping shows mainly spruce. There should be more deciduous trees, important for bird and bad habitat included, it goes on. So I would like to um, ask that while total appreciation of the evergreens, um, it seems like we've abandoned any of the deciduous trees in the shrubbery. So I just like that under consideration. Also, um, one of the documents I have here is called the line of sight map. We talked about it on the last meeting. If anybody cares to look at it, I brought it with me. I have some comments on that. We discussed it a bit in the last meeting where we were. Um, it actually appears for me to be a very generic template that's used for this evaluation. The document shows the residence, which is the residence of mine, in line of sight BB, set at six feet high, uh, the high sight line at approximately the first floor elevation. The actual sight line from my home on the first floor is actually 10 feet above grade. I stood on the ground, stood in my first floor window, and made sure I made a mark, and it's about 10 feet. So my visual aspect is from 10 feet. I would like that to be noted. So therefore, the visual line of sights for both the horizontal and angular do not replicate the actual visual impacts. Uh, the document also only utilizes a single level home. The residence referenced in B2B is actually a two-story. So what about that line of sight that is not being included? Does this infer that what is seen from the second floor is not being considered, and if so, why not? And since we assume we're not prisoners to be forced to huddle in our home, why is the sight line only evaluating the home? There is a complex deck system set at equal measure to the first floor elevation, and it is actively used as a living area and our yard abuts Route 17 k we're about 60 feet across, and so we are not allowed to be considered in all these aspects as part of that line of sight. On August 6th of 2019, am I too loud? Carling Associates' Leslie Dotson suggests a simple noise study may be helpful to address noise impacts, then states, it seems important to note that the warehouse base for the warehouse building on proposed lot two, which lot is closest to the north and the west, are facing the south. This means the backup noise generated by trucks backing up to the base would be shielded by the structure itself. Only employee car parking is located on the west side of that building. The proposed warehouse building on proposed lot one shows some bays to both the north and the south though the ones facing the north should be shielded from the higher grade of lot two, as well as the building itself on lot two to the north. It is written as a statement of fact, which I believe is only opinion, as any actual acoustic information is not referenced. Added to the fact that sound, and not just backup beepers, truckload and unload and other processes stemming from a warehouse travel in an acoustic wave and are propagated. 
the wave then striking a solid, in this case perhaps a metal surface or reflected back. Sound direction changes in many solid mediums, as in the case of many metals, actually conduct the sound with greater efficiency than air. The sound waves that resonate between the warehouses can in fact be amplified as the warehouses are placed in parallel to each other. Also, air density definitely affects how sound and how far it can be detected. None of this is being considered. So I question the fact that it will shield the noise. It won't. I studied communications electronics. Sound waves do things. They just don't dissipate. You think about when you put your speaker in a box, it gets amplified when it can be focused. Those buildings can act as a focus. Okay. Um, okay. And I did review other things, but on the fact that I know you want to go on, there's more documentation. I'll um, I will rest. We'll see okay. at the next one. But there is more. But I'll be brief tonight, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, anyone else on uh, this project? Yes. Karina, right? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, this gentleman. Okay. No, no, you're up. Oh, clearing, clearing the path. Um, like Karina Tipton, I just have a one quick comment. This is on the response to comments letter that is dated August 15th with reference to the traffic studies um, because I, as you may know, have been reviewing the Sailfish documents. I noticed that the applicant had included some trip generated estimates from other projects in the area and I wanted to point out that I believe they are underestimating the traffic generated from Project Sailfish into the study area, and I, I wanted to request that the board and its consultants double check these numbers. Um, I don't have access to all of the documents that are included on this. Um, also, I wanted to make a note that they're referring to 2% growth of traffic in this area based on historic uh, DOT data as conservative, and I wanted to note that that also is in opposition to statements made by other applicants. I believe the 2% growth is conservative, but I just wanted to point out that there's a lot of different traffic studies being submitted to this planning board and they all have different conclusions being drawn from them. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, Corey. Yeah, hi. Let's uh, try to keep this quick because I know you had uh, want to keep moving Thank you. here. Um, but a couple of things I'm still going to point out. I believe that you yourself asked for, one of the things was an architectural rendering from the applicant three months ago. I don't think that's been provided yet at all. Uh, still, my question still exists for the well and, and the people's waters up in that area. That's still ongoing, hasn't been done. Um, question I had was also still, I mean, if anybody can explain how we had multiple FEASs and it was great that they reduced uh, the water demand for fire suppression by over a thousand gallons. How, how did they get that figure? I, I, for three iterations that you had of the FES since March, you kept staying with one number and all of a sudden miraculously you reduced it by a thousand. I don't understand how that came, so I was hoping somebody would explain that. The what was requested, I believe, by Leslie Dotson, snow removal location on the property still not addressed. Uh, impervious surface, nobody takes into consideration the blacktop, the paving that's going on. I didn't see, I saw in the, in the paperwork, it just said rooftops. That's all I saw. Um, the uh, August 6th uh, Mesa cover letter says uh, sampling frequency and groundwater monitoring have not been met, but I'm just curious why there's no reference in any of his correspondence to well number four, which we now know is under a parking lot. And uh, talking with the DEC, they still say that's still viable because we've had my own discussion with the DEC, as I'm sure they have as well. Um, the other question was, um, you, you saw the letter from the attorney, I know the last meeting, where they said they would give up construction on Sunday. But the operating hours, after multiple iterations of this, all of a sudden goes to 24 seven, 
seven days a week, including holidays. And that, to me, is still not acceptable. I don't understand what changed and why that changed all of a sudden. That's in the paperwork now. And that should not be, to me, allowed to stand. But, you know, I have to live there. I have to deal with this. Um, again, uh, there was also a comment, I believe, by Leslie Dotson was asking a question about lot three. I guess maybe it might be a parking lot for repossessed cars. I don't know, but uh, storage area. Uh, you're going to have to maybe put security fencing up. And how would you do that on top of a cap? Well, I called the DEC and they said, under no circumstances can you penetrate the cap. You'd have to have a lot of uh, detail information. So I make sure you know that. Um, the other thing, just very quickly, I, I know we talked about this being an I-3 area. And um, it's, it's, it's supposedly this island. But I've come to learn that, that I-3 only became effect because it was the Skibitskis who wanted it that way. So therefore, in my opinion, they've kind of created this situation. The area of this property was originally RA2 zone. The industrial was toward the back end of the property, which I obviously am not going to complain about, but it was originally RA2. Skibitsky wanted to change that back in 1964, and he... Um, had a non-conforming use, and that's why he he did it. So for to have uh, see letters here saying all oh, the hours now, you know, the we're not going to change the building size because it wouldn't be economically feasible for us. We're not going to change the hours because it's not economically feasible. That's not my problem. They created the issue. I did not. I have to live with that. And the, um, talking about the residential, I don't know if you if you're interested, but I just made these uh, little showing is up here, showing that it's not just uh, it's not just an isolated area. There are plenty of this is what the area looks like. It's not conducive. There's a lot of residential areas that you guys got to really know that exists. This is B4, this, right? This is B4 right here. here only, only, only this section right here, maybe here, but all this is residential. Mm -hmm. All that's residential. And all homes, 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 so you're affecting, for one family, you're going to affect all these residents that you have to take into consideration. Now, I mean, I have plenty here if you wanted to see it, but, to, but no, that is the character of the neighborhood, and we really should be changing the character of the neighborhood. Um, and the last thing just that I had was <clears throat> proposed line of sight. This is what we see, and they state a lawyer wrote a letter saying how it didn't, wasn't going to affect anything, but we won't see supposedly the warehouse that's going to be right here as you come off. And you guys probably know this, but you're going to tell me I'm not going to see a warehouse here on Bracken Road and you're looking to put a proposed driveway cut right here, right here on Lakeview, and the school, the school itself is right here with the doctor's office and all these residents. It just doesn't make any sense. All right, so, thanks. Good. I don't know if you want a copy of Walter for everybody or not. That's up one, to you. Just, just, this is fine. Thank you. Fine. I'll take it. And again, we will wait. I guess you make the changes. We'll wait for documentation. But we have contacted it's the DOT, and I know the accident report was supposed to be submitted too. Right. And I know so the mayor says a traffic report came in, but we looked at that traffic report ourselves. There's no mention of accidents yet, and it's still under investigation. So there's yeah, we'll wait on that too. All right. So we'll see what happens, what the changes will be. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? That accident um, history was submitted to DOT, Larry? Yes, it was. Did you, can we get a copy of that? We, have a copy. we were, we sent it to you. We sent you a, a submission of it. Okay. Uh, if you need it submitted, uh, paper copy, that's fine. We submitted it digitally. If we can have a paper copy for the record, please. Sure. Um, okay. Um, so we've got a number of things that we're waiting on and that we'll need to do. Um, we should probably have prior to reconvening the hearing. Um, 
we have a holiday weekend coming up. It's highly unlikely we'll have everything put together for the night. Rather than reconvening and bringing everybody in with our workload, I'm going to suggest the 30th. Any comment, anyone, on that? Does that sound good? Oh, that's why. So it's going to be September 23rd, 2019. We'll reconvene the hearing then. Pardon? Uh, we don't have anything else, so 7.30. Uh, so a motion to extend, uh, reconvene this hearing on September 23rd at 7.30. Motion by Bill, seconded by Rich. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. This will be the public's uh, notice of that's when that hearing will be. Okay, thank you. Next this evening is KCE New York 2 LLC and KCE New York 1 1 LLC, Route 17 K and Browns Road, SEU permit and site plan, battery energy storage. This is an initial opening of a public hearing. Representing the applicant is Hi Clark. How are you? Hi. Good. Chairman, thank you. Good evening, Chairman. As you stated, my name's Hyde Clark. I'm the attorney for the applicant. We have KCE NY2 LLC and KCE NY11 LLC. Uh, here with me tonight is also Aaron Curtin from uh, Key Capture Energy. We have Lisa Oliver, uh, our engineer from Fisher Associates. And we have our electrical engineer, uh, Scott Reynolds. Just to give an overview, since this is our first uh, initial public hearing tonight, what we're proposing is two unmanned uh, battery storage facilities. We're located at, uh, near the intersection of Browns Road and 17K. Uh, those uh, two proposed facilities are permitted uses, subject to site plan review and special exception permit as public utility structures. Uh, we're located near the Coldenham substation, which we will be uh, tying into with a Gentile line uh, from our facility. Behind the KCE2 facility uh, is a proposed substation uh, to help facilitate uh, that, uh, that building. So again, KCE2 is a uh, 54,000 square foot building. All the components for the battery storage facility are gonna be located within inside, inside that building. The uh, KCE NY11 proposed facility to the west uh, will be located, uh, those uh, battery components will be located in containers. Those containers uh, measure uh, about 40 feet long and 9 feet wide, or 40 feet long, 8 feet wide. Uh, we did make our initial presentation, uh, initial application to the board in February. Uh, just to update the public, we have been to the planning board workshop session for two meetings. Our application has been reviewed by Garling Associates. We've had six review letters uh, by Jim Farr, the uh, engineering consultant. We've had two review letters. We did receive our uh, Orange County planning review letter back today, uh, and we'll have a response to those comments that we received today. Uh, we have two curb cuts on the KCE2 facility and uh, one access point for KC-11. We have received conceptual approval from DOT uh, for those curb cuts. And um, again, it's an unmanned facility. There's no water services to the facility. There's no sewer. Uh, there will be no traffic generated from the facility after construction. The facility is uh, monitored 24-7, uh, but off-site, so there's uh, there, there will be no one uh, inside either facility. And, uh, 
would just reserve uh, some time after initial comment if you'd like us to, to come up and potentially respond to any comments that we received tonight. Okay, yeah, if you, if you want to. I do have, um, I have a, a site plan here. I have uh, visual simulations of what each facility will look like. If anybody uh, would like to come up after uh, to review them, uh, happy to meet them in the hallway and, and go over uh, anything that we have to. Okay, um, I'll open the floor up to comments. Um, anybody here like to ask a question, make a comment on this uh, proposal? Sure, just come on up, state your name for the record, and uh, ask your question. Thomas Walcott from Maybrook. Uh, I had a question with regard to the size of the uh, batteries that they're talking about and that they're going to be self-contained. Would there any uh, special arrangements have to be made for firefighting? I do want to... Thank you. So uh, the technology is lithium ion batteries. Um, in terms of the, the size of what they are, is they're uh, arranged in modules, which are then arranged in racks. Um, within that rack is a uh, fire suppression system uh, to manage that. The cells are uh, what are called starved cells, so there's, an actual, there's no free moving liquid within the cell. Uh, in terms of working with the fire department, we have contacted the fire chief will, will develop an emergency response plan if necessary. And um, you know, a big, a big part of what Key Capture does is that education component of working with the fire department, working with the town to make sure that everyone's on the same page in the event if uh, it's necessary that uh, they know how to respond. Anyone else? Yes. Patricia. So um, I, I want to mention a couple of things that the Conservation Advisory Council had some concerns about. Um, one of them um, was in when, when we looked at the acoustic study table three, um, it says the sound level will be between 45 and 53 decibels. The Nautilus to between moving from quiet urban nighttime to quiet urban, uh, excuse me, using quiet urban day, nighttime and quiet urban daytime sound levels. So that means that people on this relatively quiet rural road will be experiencing quite a change in the sound factor. And we think that sound screening methods um, should definitely be employed, particularly since if the noise is intermittent, um, it can be startling if it's not a regular type sound. Um, the other thing that we notice is that the trees uh, that were being planted, 10 to 14 feet tall trees, are being planted to screen a 27 foot building. So it doesn't seem like there's really going to be much vegetation, um, you know dispersing the sound. Um, the other um, factor, I read through the NYSERDA guidelines for storage batteries, and um, it seems like there's some, uh, somebody mentioned the fire factors. Um, there are quite a lot of strict regulations regarding fire safety. Um, they also mentioned potential to release toxic gas during charging and discharging and normal use. Um, they say there should be a hazardous exhaust system, which I don't know is being included. Um, they definitely um, say there should be an emergency operation plan. Um, the other factor is um, in terms of the proximity to Tinbrook, we're concerned that the Tinbrook and the wetlands may be affected by this in terms of um, uh, this reduction in wetland storage facility, and since it's very close to Timbrook, and also um, the type of material and gravel that's being put down could possibly change the pH of Timbrook. So 
So those were a couple of concerns we had. But the biggest thing, I think, is the sound factors and the health possible health hazards. Thank you. Welcome. Anyone else? Hi. Hi. Uh, Serena, Assistant, again. Um, I have a, a question. In reviewing some of the documents provided by the applicant, in one of their submittal cover letters urging for a fast review from the planning board, they made a reference to um, the expiration or the closure of a winding for some type of funding or licensing, um, which I believe has already passed. And I, I wanted to ask if that was still a concern and when the next um, licensing or funding window would open up. And I'm asking this because I have noticed that we have a lot of projects in front of the planning board that have been open since 2005 in some situations, and I'm concerned about incurring another project that will just remain on the books for a really long time. Um, I'm not sure if you'd like me to pause now or uh, no, just um, save the comment for. Can you answer the question? Yeah, so sure. that. And your name? I'm Erin Curtin. I work for Key Capture Energy. Yeah, so that timeline was part of the NISO, the New York Independent System Operator Interconnection Process. That was the start of the 2019 class year. Um, and the uh, regulatory requirements to get into that class year is a negative declaration. Um, that class year started in August. Uh, there is a uh, ability in the OAT, uh, which is one of the things that guidelines NISO, uh, to get into the class year with a per, uh, deposit in lieu of that permitting milestone. So we have proceeded with that. Um, and we'll get that deposit back when we've reached that permitting milestone. Thank you. Um, I also had another question for the planning board. Um, in one of the response to comments letters provided by the applicant, um, they referred to a referral from FAR Associates to the ZBA, um, specifically with reference to the placement of transmission lines within 60 feet of 17K, which is not permitted by our code. Um, and then when Walt came back when the building is, I'm, I'm sorry, it was within 600 feet. I believe they are on the plan supposed to be within 60 feet, which is why it was referred to the ZBA for a determination. Um, thank you for clarifying that. Um, when our building in inspector returned to work, he rescinded that referral, and I wanted to ask the planning board if that was um, kind of typical and if this was a situation where it did actually require a referral and a determination by the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, and then the last thing is, uh, Patricia did mention the NYSERDA uh, webinar. There is, there is a recorded webinar and a, a really good workbook and a, a set of um, documents and checklists. And I wanted to ask if the planning board would like one of us to send that to you for your information. We can go, I, I saw somebody say we have that. Okay, super, all right, great. And we've so, also been a bunch of us have been to the seminar. Okay, I think one other thing, that's really excellent. I'm really, thanks guys for being so great at your jobs. Um, one other thing I, I did want to mention too is that um, on the CAC we did ask if there was a similar facility that we could go to because as Patricia said we are concerned about the noise impacts and I believe the response was is that there are no similar facilities nearby that we could take a look at. Um, we have heard that there might be some in like Haverstraw for example. Um, I'm not sure if those are analogous to the facilities that you're intending to construct um, but I, I do think that having a real understanding of the noise impacts um, not just for the residents on that very rural road, but also to the Tinbrook and to issues surrounding with uh, wildlife in that corridor. The Tinbrook corridor is also something that should be really seriously evaluated. So thank you. Is there a facility close by similar to this one? <coughs> so I'd say the sound uh, would be most similar to a substation. Uh, you know, the transformers at the substation, that would be a similar sound. Um, so the place where there are some of those transformers together would be the most analogous comparison. Okay. Thank you. In other words, you're saying that the transformers in the substation are similar to what you had. The noise emanating from that <laughs> substation is similar. That's correct. Yes. Now, there's probably a couple of transformers over there. How many are you going to have? Yes, there are 10. Pardon? There's, uh, there's 10 transformers outside on New York 11. Yes. And then the transformers for New York 2 are going to be located within the building. Okay. So, but there's uh, there's no similar battery storage facility nearby. But what we're saying is that the sound is coming from the transformer, which is similar to existing substations. Okay. Any um, 
just to clarify, it was Walsh. It was uh, Chairman Fallon of the ZBA that asked Walsh to relook at it after he received more information from the applicant. Anyone else? Okay. Um, County comments, we just opened the hearing. And you got Karen's comments? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, you got some feedback from uh, public this evening. Um, I suggest maybe we can have you back on. Uh, we do have a binding comment, though. And mm -hmm. I believe, isn't there some regulation in regard to firefighting that was brought up at the seminar? Yeah, one of the questions that Sarah had, had emphasized was that the most updated fire code requirements are ISB 2021, mm -hmm. and, and they suggested when the board members asked about this project specifically, they, they said that we should be asking you to specifically if you would be complying with the requirements of ISB 2021. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this uh, in our, this project NY two is probably not going to be constructed for you know, two to three years. So, I mean, to make it a condition that we have to be in compliance with the uh, code that's in effect at that time. I mean, that's would be part of a building permit, I would think. Uh, well, from what I sort of was saying. Yeah, we can dis yeah. discuss that. And okay. Okay. The next question was, um, <coughs> they said that we should be asking you about decommissioning plan and bonding for the same. Mm -hmm. and, and they they explained that that was actually more important than decommissioning the entire solar panels. So we would want you to address that as well. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we will be submitting a full decommissioning plan for that, uh, creating a full decommissioning plan for that. At this point, I know we've submitted, uh, you know, that one-page removal letter. It was with our initial application back in February, uh, but there will be a full decommissioning plan for this project. Okay. Thank you. Um, do you have a spill prevention control and countermeasure plan? We do. We've submitted that for both facilities. Okay. So we have that. Yep. Yes, that's been submitted, and uh, I know that that's the one binding recommendation, so we have no problem meeting that. Okay. Yes, Rich. Um, basically, three of us from the board and our planning consultant went to the NI Serta seminar a few weeks back, and it was uh, certainly very eye-opening to us, these type of facilities. Um, I guess it's called a Tier 3 dedicated system. And I sort of basically spoke about a series of plans that you needed to provide to us. Um, commissioning plan, a fire safety plan, operation and maintenance plan, hazard mitigation analysis, and a decommissioning. Mm -hmm. um, so. Well, I think we touched on a, a few of those that, okay. that we will be submitting that, so the decommissioning plan. Also, uh, yeah, I can um, add a little bit more to that. So we will be creating all of those, uh, you know, Great. we are required to, to do that for other reasons as well. And so we will be creating full sets of those plans. Um, we have not yet submitted a BOP RFP for a contractor and we would not at this stage. Mm -hmm. And so at this time, a lot of the materials that would go into those sorts of plans would be assumptions. Mm -hmm. And so we would propose giving you guys the full 
uh, plans once they've been created, uh, you know, and having that be more with the building permit. I assume that you would be, you know, I mean, it's, you do this for a living, so. Uh, <laughs> yes. I, I just, it was eye opening to us, the seminar, the nice sort of seminar. So we didn't realize that what was involved, so thank you, and we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have no other comment from the public. Board, any, anyone else would comment on the KCE? Um, there is a fair amount of information that we need. Sir, I may have missed it, but I, do you people have any uh, information on your lighting plan? Yeah, I believe we've submitted the lighting plan. I wanted to see. Sir. Yeah. We've submitted the lighting plan from the. <laughs> We've submitted a lighting plan and then uh, there was a comment to see a larger version of the lighting plan, basically look at the lighting plan plus the impact on the surrounding areas. So we resubmitted a second version where it showed not just the project facility, but also the uh, uh, 17K plus the, the tin broke above it. With the catalog numbers with the fixtures and so on? Yes, yeah. Okay, I'll get my hands on that, thank you. Yes, and we'd be happy to provide that again if you'd like us to send that over. Um, what I'm thinking is maybe the ninth is too early to bring up the 20 the, tw the ninth is too early um, Maybe be best the 23rd we could be a little further along I think we feel that we could provide those responses to the, the responses that we've received and okay. by the ninth if the board is has availability it Still takes the year time Yeah, we have to have them and look at them. Unfortunately, we have this Holiday weekend. Uh, I think we'd be better off on the twenty on the twenty third. I agree. No, seven forty five. Complicated and it's new for us. So. Yeah, it's brand new, and not all of us unfortunately could attend the seminar. So, um, so I'll entertain a motion to extend this hearing. Uh, this is uh, out to the twenty third of September at nine forty five. Motion by. Whoa, whoa. Oh, I'm sorry, 745. <laughs> I had too many nights on my brain. Not that late. Yeah, not that late, yeah. Uh, motion by John, seconded by Ryan. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. This will be the public's notice of that date. Okay? 745. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Next this evening is uh, Blue Water Industrial Partners LLC Project Sailfish, New York State Route 17K and 747, SEU Permit Site Plan, continuation of the public hearing. Um, we are awaiting the compilation of our review on the site plan uh, for the applicants, uh, for our review and the applicants' review. Uh, this, so this hearing will not be closed this evening as uh, we, we will get that review soon and we'll need to review, uh, go through that thoroughly. Um, are there any updates on the plan, Chuck? Or I think we're probably in the... No changes, Mr. Chairman. Okay. 
All right, uh, this is a public hearing, so is there anyone from uh, the audience that has a question or comment? Something that we haven't heard, I hope? Yeah, you haven't heard this. Okay, Rich, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> you haven't heard this. Uh, well, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Okay, uh, there's uh, a little that could be said that uh, Blue Water hasn't come up with a solution for. You know, I mean, they, they've taken care of everything. So what, what, what more can you ask, right? But I got a problem, fundamental problem. And uh, I say that the town board and pl the planning board do not have the authority to broadly interpret zoning for Blue Water and Medline projects as allowable structures accepted, acceptable under the existing zoning codes. The planning board responded on numerous occasions to those questioning the legitimacy of the million square foot buildings with comment, the building is allowed by our building codes. This allowance came from the planning board and town boards making a special permit use to include million square foot buildings without public approval. The fact a building such as a warehouse is allowed in each location, International Boulevard and 416, is not basis for including over a million square foot building structures in those proposed locations. A 40,000, 100,000, or even a 250,000 square foot building could be conceived included in the code as it is written now, and such buildings could be acceptable. However, a million square foot warehouses are another matter as they encompass more than just a simple warehouse, they are in fact an entire pollution factory of noise, air, water, sewage, ground, water, visual, traffic, trash generation, and not least, impermeable surfaces. Uh, you can't compare a 40,000 square foot building's permeable surfaces to a million square foot building. Locations of proposed buildings over 500,000 square feet have to require public approval in advance and the master plan should indicate exactly where these megastructures are going to be located on a zoning map with red blocks. Public meeting must be held to have locations pre-approved and not by rationalizing the term warehouse as inclusive of all sizes. Size does matter. The town of Montgomery master plan should clearly state the only place in Montgomery allowing million square foot buildings is on Neely Town Road unless approved by the public master plan. Town board and planning board should not be allowed to adjust the code book to fit the building size. These two projects should be put on hold until public meetings can be held to approve locations for any buildings over 500,000 square feet. Until locations are approved through public meetings, Blue Water and Medline projects should be on hold. The town of Montgomery did not inform local residents in the vicinity of the project back early in 2018 when it was evolving. I received no letter indicating attention. A million square foot building is being planned right behind your property. I never got, well, knew that. Everybody should receive a register letter on this project right out at the starting gate instead of major decisions being made for six months before most even knew about it. If a million square foot building warehouse was being scheduled behind your house, would you not like to know about that right away? This project was stealthily conducted for the better half of 2018 where significant decisions, zoning changes, and sewer plant custody were being made between Blue Water and the town supervisor. These projects should have been disapproved when it was laid on the supervisor's desk at the beginning of 2018 because there was nothing in the code book that talked about buildings of these sizes. At best, the code could include a 250 or 300,000 square foot warehouse, but insulin insinuating the code allows 1.1 million square houses is preposterous. Although it is technically and physically possible to put a million square foot warehouse on the proposed sites, that does not imply it is a good thing to do. Both areas have very sensitive wetlands and the size of the buildings are overwhelming. There is a serious problem here with our master plan and code book. The big picture is size doesn't matter. If this project was one third the current design, I think it would be acceptable to many people now who are against it. Um, the sewer plant. 
the FDI has stated this facility, and the FDI has stated this facility. I know I was here before, and, and the, uh, the attorney here told me that it wasn't going to happen that way, but it does state it in the document that the uh, facility will be turned over to the town of Montgomery as soon as it's completed. As I have previously stated, ownership of this facility was a make or break decision for Blue Water to continue due diligence. It was done early in the project, probably around May or June of 2018. I am very confident Blue Water's continuation of its due diligence was dependent on this facility was handled. Without a doubt, Blue Water seen the facility as a headache, a problem they did not need, and interfered with the Bing building, so, so sought relief through the town of Montgomery. Blue Water was not going to be satisfied with a verbal from the town supervisor or even the town board. Blue Water wanted a commitment in writing, so the building inspector was directed to send a letter to Blue Water in September last year committing to assume ownership of the facility. This was not only wrong, it was totally unnecessary commitment. The urgency for this town to assume ownership gives you some idea as to the importance of this matter. This issue should have been never been agreed to without a public hearing concerning the takeover of the facility by the town. Furthermore, because of this early commitment, all planning board meetings since January were essentially for naught since the decision about this was made half a year earlier. There should have been an open meeting to the public requesting approval to take over the plan. A public meeting should be held on this issue before any further work proceeds on Sailfish Project. I'm very confident that a public meeting will not be in favor of taking over the, the ownership of that facility. Um, that's all I have. to the FEIS, the DEIS, and the scoping document. And there are some areas where there is confusion um, and some inaccuracies. Uh, we, did you get it written down so they can just get it cleared up for it, tomorrow? It will be. Okay, yes, great. it will all be in there. Good. Um, in the scoping document, on page four, it says the current tenant is unknown. However, the project description will include language that clearly defines the possible tenants that could occupy the building from a use perspective. This is a rental. You don't have the option as a board saying who someone else can rent the building to. If it fits the use in general for under that zoning code, you have no ability to stop that tenant from moving forward. Um, on page four also, it should be noted that there will be no on-site fuel storage tanks or truck repairs performed on site. But comment 15-5 from the New York State DEC notes that on pages 8-2 and 8-3 of the DEIS, there's discussion about on-site diesel storage. The response that was given in the FEIS is that the diesel tank would be located adjacent to the fire pump. This is a conflict with the scoping document requirement. Um, on 22-12 notes that both hydrogen and liquid nitrogen would be stored on site. Hydrogen is highly flammable and explosive. The applicant's response is that the safety measures would be instituted by the tank vendor and the still undisclosed warehouse operator. The planning board will have no knowledge of nor privy with either of these entities. So both statements by the applicant are inconsistent with the scoping documents. Um, they speak about existing conditions and I'm still trying to find where my 145,000 square foot building is noted. I go through the documents, they note an art installation, there is no acknowledgement of 145,000 square feet that has been in use since the 1960s with over 125 employees. It's not there. They discount us completely, including 
in the section at the back of the SWIP where they go through a section on um, existing use in the surrounding area, we're still not there. I've talked numerous times at public hearings about College Talix relocating back to this facility with 100 full-time year-round employees and the acquisition by UAP, who is a multinational art fabrication enterprise with corporate offices on three continents and general offices in 40 countries. And this is adjacent to the public site. They, we have discussed um, expanding onto the vacant land on the west side of 747. However, it's unlikely that they will do so as the runoff from discharge point three and discharge point one feed either the wetland on the southern portion or the outfall on the northern portion. There is a stream that divides our properties which will be over Whelmed with additional water. The stormwater plan discusses rate and not volume. The soils are already hydric soils. We have been maintaining the property to keep down the vegetation. The only third qualification for creating a wetland is standing water. So I meet the first major requirement by soil condition. I'm maintaining the property by mowing it so I don't yet have all of the wetland vegetation. Once that water comes, I'm done. My property becomes virtually unbuildable. Um, it's been shown to increase levels of cortisol in both children and adults, and that can contribute to everything from cardiovascular disease, cognitive function, and sleep disorders. Um, this information has been brought to the board prior, not only for this project, but for others, and there, nothing has been addressed to mitigate this problem. The thought that plantings are going to stop sound is ludicrous. They don't, and the plantings will take 20 to 30 years to develop and be tall enough and dense enough to have an impact. Um, the applicant was also required to describe the area, list the impacts, and provide mitigation. I'm getting tired of their comment, which states too many times to even count that the project has been designed to limit adjacent area impact to the greatest extent practical. I don't want practical, I want possible possible isn't included. As I stated uh, earlier, the, this is a wildlife corridor. This project encompasses virtually all of the buildable land. I've stated that there, the building proper itself sits on top of a wetlands, and if you look at, I believe it's CS100, you will see a designated wetland not a regulated wetland, but a designated wetland underneath the building proper. When I look at the drawings and compare drawings from, um, I think it was CS100 to maybe it was CG, it's difficult to determine what is an access road and what is a stream bed. For some reason, they use the parallel and offset lines interchangeably on different drawings, so it's impossible to determine whether something is a roadway or if it's a stream bed or a vernal stream bed. Um, the applicant only acknowledges regulated wetlands. They ignore unregulated and smaller, and they deny that this, these other wetlands exist. Um, just as forests are our world's lungs, water is our life's blood, and wetlands are the heart and filters that keep our world healthy. This project destroys all three. Just because a plan meets the absolute minimum requirement for development doesn't mean that the planning board should not hold them to a higher standard whenever possible. Our weather patterns are rapidly changing. The planning board should require future modeling. Future modeling for every major project. 
The hundred year storms are now every three to five years. We cannot ignore the fact that 2007 was the wettest year on record or that 2018 into 19 is one of the warmest. These patterns will continue and we must be prepared for these changes. We have to look forward and not only to the past on all of these. Um, the applicant also states that a supplemental EIS is not warranted when in fact the SEIS is warranted based on over a thousand pages of drawings, calculations, and details that were submitted on July 25th. Even the engineer stated that he had not reviewed every drawing and every calculation for accuracy. An SEIS should be required to properly review all of the additional documents. Um, they're seeking a zone change, and this applies specifically to site uh, the site acceptance site chain, the, the special exception. site application. Um, the zone change would go from IB to I2. We were originally I2. If the project proceeds as it now is, it cuts off another adjacent I2 property from having major access. So it makes that I2 designation on Maple Avenue irrelevant. They denied the access, saying that it was, I believe, inconsistent with their plan. But that also creates spot zoning, because that will be the only piece of I-2 property available in the entire area. Everything around it is either business, interchange business, residential, agricultural. There is no other industrial. Um, there was a question regarding hazardous materials in the warehouse. The applicant has no way of controlling what a lessee sells. For them to say that there would be no hazardous materials stored on site is impossible. They do not control that saleable portion. Companies such as Amazon, um, Wayfair, all of these companies do sell chemicals often hazardous chemicals such as chlorine, acids, and solvents. The applicant answered the questions concerning hazardous material just as though it was only referring to bulk storage. Um, they also state that the, applicable, the, the only applicable development in the area is Dunkin' Donuts. They have forgotten our repeated comments about the return of Polish Talix, the size of our building, the volume of traffic that goes past our driveways every single day already. In the traffic impact statement, the level of service with A being the best and F being the worst gets worse in the build conditions. These conditions are worse at Browns Road and the intersection of 17K and 747 in Stonecastle. Um, on page 30 of the TIS, Table 8 and page 32. The build conditions both uh, at these intersections both have a grade F at peak times. There's unfortunately no way to mitigate that through timing. We have this little thing called right on red. And if traffic is turning right, you can't turn left. You can't pull out of your driveway because you will be interfering. You will be going into oncoming traffic. It should be noted that the analytics used for the traffic build from the DOT, but the base data is not current. It's from 2009 to 2014. Over the past five years, there has been a significant increase in the number of businesses and housing developments in this area. The traffic builds are outdated, and while the New York State DOT may not have updated reports, consideration must be given to current conditions, and additional studies should be required. They remain steadfast in their assumption that pedestrian traffic is virtually non-existent at the intersection of 747 and 17K. But I can assure you that people from my building do cross the street to go have lunch at Johnny's. And I can also assure you that many people park illegally in my parking lot and walk across the street the same way. Um, they acknowledge that, or they feel that their employee base will be traveling to and from the site, but assume that these people will take 84. It's likely that these people will live either north or west of the site, as the cost of housing is far less. 
these people will be more likely to take either Rock Cut Road to 52 or 17K to Bloomingburg and take 17 going north, as these roads provide the shortest distance and fastest transit to these areas. While 84 is an interstate, it's not always the shortest distance or the shortest time between these areas. Um, the applicant has acknowledged that runoff will increase. They address rate, but very rarely the impact of volume on hydric soils where saturation is already evident. They've noted that in their test pits that there was water evident at one foot. There is no more room for this water to go other than to expand the wetland and floodplain areas. Um, I've also noted a few anomalies in the DEC permit application that was included in the um, FEIS. Tax ID isn't noted. Only two of the properties were included. Property is listed as commercial, and not industrial. There's no note of potential runoff into the wetlands, even though construction will occur in the areas adjacent. Um, Question 27 was odd. It listed a reduction in parking when the original plan called for a third as many cars. It went from like 300 and change to over 1,000. Long-term operation and maintenance is listed as Blue Water Industrial Partners, but the applicant states that in the IDA application that it will be turned over to USAA, and then that maintenance of the property goes to the lessee. So that is an, an, an inaccuracy in the DEC um, speedies permit. Um, the application is still not signed or dated, and I don't know if that is a requirement at this time. Um, I've spoken at length about future plans. I've talked to the board in great depth about where the town should be looking, what we are going to do, and what we want to be. I want you to take a step back and look at viable projects that would enhance the community with well-paying jobs. Look to create corridors of technology, corridors where 3D modeling and 3D printing is a viable source. We've got a huge arts community, a tremendous theatrical community in this area. To be able to utilize this property for something other than heavy, other than a high impact, low rate of return on employment, because these are not high paying jobs, would do greatly to benefit this community. I want to see something that is more than a great big box on the hill. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Selfish. My comment isn't going to be as good as Barbara's, but um, I'm just limiting tonight's comment on the um, the site plans. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Sure. Um, I just wanted to point out um, there's some discrepancies in the construction sequencing as described in the final environmental impact statement and the phasing as described on the site plans and in their notes. In particular, it talks about daily construction vehicle volumes being significantly less than volumes that will be ge generated by the site under the build condition. Um, this is a big discrepancy because the only access during construction until you reach phase six is going to be to Route 17K. Um, so you're, you're looking at, I didn't bring my piece of paper out, but you're looking at, I think it says uh, 150 to 200 passenger cars per day and uh, hundreds of trucks during an um, eight plus seven week period. The duration of traffic as it's entering and exiting Route 17K through a stabilized construction and trends is going to be pretty significant. And I would like the planning board to work with the applicant to come up with a more um, thorough solution. Uh, also, I didn't notice any kind of tracking pad or any other kind of construction protection for Route 17K. As we all know, that is a very busy road and it is a very busy interchange and any kind of debris or rock or concrete or uh, mud, um, soil, uh, there's a huge amount of soil that's going to be moved around. They've got a, a very long access road and I, I just didn't see any stabilized, in addition to the stabilized construction interest, I didn't see any kind of tracking pad 
or any kind of method to uh, prevent sediment control um, when you're going in and off of the site. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on sailfish? Yes. I can. Thank you for hearing me, Chairman. My name is Sheree C A G R I Zahakis Z A H A K O S. Thank you. I'm here for more a general statement uh, as we absorb and try to evaluate all the warehouses. I've taken the time, and I'm not sure if any of you've had the ability to sit down and look at our zoning map. I've tried to evaluate uh, using both Google Maps and even uh, learning even a little bit more today working within the planning room itself. When you look at the I-1s, the I-2s, the I-3s, and the I-4s, when you evaluate all those lands, most all of them are now taken. With the addition of the possibility of Medline and Sailfish, you've basically eliminated most of any of the I-1 and the I-2. There is very few I-3 open. There is a great area of I-4 that I see that's not used. One of the missions, and you know it, I don't have to say it, is to look forward in this town. That is part of 20-30, I think. You must plan for the future. Just because we can have gas stations in, in an area doesn't mean we need 70 gas stations end to end. I know the law requires you to evaluate them if they're different and unique. But as you go forward in evaluating this and the lands that we are giving up, I can look at it and say that over 50% of it is somewhat being dedicated to oil warehouse of various aspects. Now, I understand the county has picked us and highlighted us because of our benefits. I've also stated to this board that those are our jewels, too. I don't think that we should necessarily just so readily give them over to the first come, first serve. There is a future. And what happens is, is by what's going on in the examination of that map on all these sites, that includes Neely Town, that includes Bracken Road, that includes Stone Castle, and others various aspects. As I've stated, we're almost out. That happens to be a prejudice to any other future type of businesses that might want to use those lands. I understand that we look to today to what is in front of us, but it is our responsibility as a town planning board and a board to plan for the future. So by obligating this land, almost all the I-2, I-1 is completely now missing on 17K. And again, we know um, Neely Town is almost all gone too. So I'd like that to be considered. Thank you. Thank you. Looking for comments on the site plan, as this is a public hearing on the site plan. Uh, anybody else got any questions on the site plan? Any specifics on the plan? No, I just want a couple comments. If they're brief. They're going to be brief. I'm Roger Wright. I'm a resident of Montgomery. I'm going to live near this Amazon warehouse. Um, have you had, any of you ever been to an Amazon warehouse? I recommend maybe you get on a bus and head down to Hazleton, PA, where they have a big Amazon warehouse. See what the truck traffic is, especially at night, because that's usually most of them uh, end up there and get unloaded. This facility, you're going to have uh, jockey wagons, which will have beep up, uh, backup alarms, flashing yellow lights. You're going to have, what, almost 300 trucks there at one time? That's a lot, of, a lot of diesel fuel up there in the event there's an accident. Uh, you talk about lighting on some of these facilities. As it is now, when it snows in the wintertime, Stewart just about lights up most of the Browns Road in that area. What do you think this lighting is going to do? Especially to that new development that's being built right across the street. You know, you're giving tax breaks to everybody. We as taxpayers are going to be flipping the bill. Did you ever consider about just making a development when people drive down 17K 
there's a beautiful established development there, houses that people can be proud of when they drive in there. Instead of driving down 17K and people go, ooh, who would live around here with these warehouses? I'm in the trucking industry, you know? <laughs> and you have no idea what the truck traffic's gonna be at night. So I advise you, take a trip down to Amazon in Hazleton, PA, and see what it's like all night long. Okay, thanks. All right, that's all I have to say. Anyone else, any comments on the site plan? Okay, board, um, we'll have our comments from our consultants after the holiday. We'll have a chance to look at them. How about we come in on the 9th, uh, resume this hearing or reconvene the hearing on the 9th at 8.15. We have two prior. We have a couple other things on our agenda. So the September 9th at 8.15, will be when we will re reconvene this hearing so people come back in with more comments and questions. Um, I need a motion, motion by John, seconded by Rich. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Thank you everybody. Tomorrow at noon is the last day, or tomorrow's the last day for written comments on the FEIS. Just a reminder for everyone. Thank you. Okay, next on our agenda this evening is uh, Galaxy Limited. Regarding their application for a warehouse on Bracken Road. The property is uh, about 33 acres. Can't hear. It's the Can you? most parcel. Sure. It is the northernmost parcel of the Galaxy Limited Holdings, which is 700 and 54 acres. Uh, this is the northern extent of it. The bulk of the property is south of 84. This is one single 33-acre um, lot uh, that exists of uh, their holdings north of 84. It was all part of the railroad property uh, back in the 70s. Um, what is proposed is a 240,000 square foot warehouse would have loading on the east side um, and a potential rail access on the west side. The eastern portion of the property fronts Barron Road. That is uh, primarily wetlands. It's been delineated. It is federal wetlands. The delineation has been sent to the Corps for their verification. Uh, access would be on the west side of the property through a driveway to Bracken Road uh, where traffic could head west on Bracken to 208 and south to 84 or north on Bracken Road to 17K and then um, east. Um, the, the project would be serviced by its own well, um, and fire protection would be provided by the town's fire protection system that exists in the area. Um, and sewer would be a, a pump station that would connect to the town sewer system that is uh, a couple hundred feet west of the site on Bracken Road. This is just our initial presentation to get an idea, uh, feedback on any zoning concerns the board may have, any specific concerns. Um, and then we will uh, provide additional detail going forward, but I'd be glad to answer uh, any questions you have at this time. Um, you, do you have any frontage on Bracken Road? Uh, no, it does not actually front on Bracken Road. There is the railroad property between the site and Bracken Road. Okay. So we would be uh, entering into an access agreement with the railroad, kind of like we did with uh, Crestwood facility. Um, all the legal frontage is on Barron Road. We have met with Middletown, New Jersey Railroad uh, preliminarily um, to discuss the site. They're excited about 
uh, providing additional rail service in this area. We're very glad to see you got a railroad in there, Russ. <laughs> There's not many sites left. Uh, Donald has been getting a lot of interest in the property. We don't have a specific user at this time, um, but there are a number of people that have touched base on over the last several months uh, regarding a site that has rail service. So. Russ, uh, how many loading docks do you have on this? Uh, we have room for 37. Not that we would build 37, but we have enough room for 37. And where are the truck, uh, the trailers going to be parked? Uh, we didn't provide any additional trailer storage on the site. We could, um, in this area, there's no wetlands, we could provide additional trailer storage if it was necessary. To be determined. To be determined, yep. Yeah. That would be, hopefully as we go through the process, um, a lot of these users are looking for a site that is further along uh, before they'll commit to anything. So hopefully as we go through the process, uh, Donald will be able to finalize uh, some kind of real estate agreement. We can then provide a little more detail on that. What's the height of the building above the, uh, the uh, driveways and things like that? Uh, the, the site is pretty flat relatively. Uh, we're on a plateau of about 412 feet, it looks like. Uh, building height is up to 55 feet. That's what your code permits. I don't see that we're going to go to that height unless there's some specific user that really would need to do that. I would think we'd probably be in the 35 to 40 foot range. Well, also, our biggest issue on Bracken Road is the intersection of 17K. Mm -hmm. uh, and Bracken Road. It's really horrible. And so, um, 208. You want you to send all your trucks the other way. Yeah. Because you can't make a right on 17K or a left without... Site distance concerns, yeah, because of the bridge there. Yeah. This is kind of similar to uh, Henry Henning. We had the uh, rail. And yes. The uh, trucks had to be accessed at that point. So I guess just having the, making sure that where the stop signs are placed and that the, no truck would ever stop or be staged so <laughs> yes so yes that so that be staged so that uh, they'd be on the rail as they're stopped to come out yeah right. uh, it's fortuitous that you have the crest project this in a lot of respects is similar um, look at the commercial private driveway as a way to meet your public permits requirement Okay. As opposed to a variance. The Barron Road access may be problematic because our code requires that it be physically able to use the public street, even if you have that access by easement also. Okay. Or the other. As you know, from Crestwood 70 60, there's some flexibility. Commercial right, we did the commercial driveway. Yep. Yeah. We took, a, we took a walk out on the site, and uh, the biggest concern we had was the northern portion of the property where the stormwater management basin. Correct. There's a couple residential houses there on Old Maybrook Road, and uh, it wasn't apparent, but it looked like you may be able to move that stormwater management to that rear pocket there that you were pointing at earlier. Um, I think that may give you some more buffer, if that's possible, uh, with grades and things like that. Um, and I think, I think it is, right? If there's anything you can do to kind of keep that uh, residential area screened yeah. as best as possible would be uh, okay we'll definitely take a look take a look at it as we develop it this area here is that that uh, looks like 408 410 and we're going to be this is 414 or so so that's definitely looks like it's possible Thank you very much. We'll send you comments tomorrow, Mark. Thank you.